Rodney, my man, what's happening today? Zinc. Zinc. I'm, oh, I didn't give you one when we went to Costa Rica, but uh, I have these little zinc tablets that I, I take for immuni- immunity. Mm. Immunity? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds right. Yeah. That sounds right. Sure. Helps boost the uh, the old immune system. Okay. Zinc is good for, I guess, killing viri and <laughs> germs in the uh, viruses <laughs> in the mouth in the mouthful area. Uh, you know, viri? You don't like viri? That's good. <laughs> Haven't heard that one before. The false plural of viruses. Mm-hmm. Zinc. That's a. Uh, it's like a. Yeah. Anyhow, when I when I'm getting sick and whatnot, if I feel something coming on, like the, you know those the the nodules in the in the throat, mm-hmm. they start swelling up. Get a little up. frog in your throat, as they once a said. Froggy. Yeah. Start taking my zinc and my vitamin D. Maybe a little bit of vitamin C, but mainly the D and the zinc. Mm. Feel so much better. That's interesting. But also when I'm traveling, when I travel, zinc and. Uh, Oh, I got another one that I have to tell you later, but zinc. Money. That's cool. All right. Well, chalk it up to another thing that Keith won't try. Close minded. Close minded. Welcome back to the More Common Podcast, a place for genuine, authentic conversation where we explore the fact that we have more in common than that which divides us. Hi, I'm Ruff, the producer, official grilled cheese aficionado. But that's not important right now. We have a review. Genuine and unscripted. Rodney and Keith are diving into real unscripted conversations, and they're not afraid to sit down and talk about the elephant in the room. Conversations on this podcast are thought-provoking and completely raw. They don't leave any stone unturned to get the real story. With that being said, we are now starting off season one. This is the first season of 2020, and we've dubbed it A Decade Possible. And this entire season is all about pursuit. Just like me pursuing the brie and the cheddar that is associated with that wheat bread in my fridge at this very moment. Remember, you can find all things more in common at moreincommonpod.com. Episodes, merchandise, and blogs. And definitely, if you like what you hear, give us a like on your favorite podcast app, leave a review, and we'll try to do the best we can to share it on air as many times as we can because, you know, self gratification and everything. On today's episode, we talk with Ethan Sandler. Now, Ethan brings a lot of humor, humility, and amazing storytelling that we just dive right into. We talk about things from success, ambition, masculinity, and just being a dad. Like, the older I get, the more I, it's so obvious how simple it is for me, and I suspect for most human beings, but for me in particular, if I meditate and I exercise, I am infinitely better as just a energy. Or I'm just very close to, and I think it's really common in this town, but I'm just close to people that are living my wildest dreams. And um, I have nothing but gratitude for the fact that I'm doing anything that looks anything remotely like what I wanted to do with my life. So that's the place that I keep trying to stay in. But it's hard to resist being like, fuck, I wish that was me. I really wish I was doing that. All right, here we are. We're back. Thanks for joining us. Today we're with Ethan Sandler. Ethan's an actor, producer, a writer in Hollywood co-produced and written episodes of popular tv shows such as man with the plan and new girl he's acted in most notably the tv series crossing jordan 
uh, The Princess Diaries, and The Born Identity. And from our our perspective, most importantly, he's a husband of 17 years and a father of two. And we're excited to have him here today. Welcome to the show, Ethan. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Welcome to my garage. Yeah. It's comfortable. So, reading your bio, uh-huh. preparing it, I was looking, I was like, man, this guy's like, he's making it. He's doing big things. He's doing good things. Uh, so, what's your, what is your definition of success? Mm. Um, I actually don't know. Uh, and I think that um, that's been, for me, just part of the challenge of being in this industry, um, like, full stop. Like, I just... Sometimes I think uh, I'm just a real comparer. So sometimes I look at Ben Stiller, for example, cable guy we've been talking about Mm -hmm. all afternoon or morning. And uh, that looks like, yeah, I should be, I want, that's what I want. And then sometimes it's like somebody totally different and unknown and that's not even in the industry and is got like a perspective on their actual life in some way that is you know, clearly a result of some serious study about how to be a person. And I'm like, that's what I fuck. I should, I want. And so I'm, I'm unfortunately um, a little wobbly on what exactly my definition of success is. I don't think I'm honestly um, pursuing success. Really? That's just not in my, on in my mind. That phrase, that notion then by by that nature do you think you've achieved success no i you know um no i don't know i i i because the because by whatever standard i think i would hold myself to either creatively or um uh, financially or titularly in terms of what i can be called in a contract or in a room or whatever um by whatever metric I would apply, I, I myself would not consider myself a <clears throat> success. It just, I don't know. So it would be, do you, is that because you're, you have a higher bar for yourself or you just haven't defined what that thing is. So you wouldn't necessarily say it hits anything or is it something else altogether? I think that, uh, um, I don't know how ambitious I am. Hmm. And so, my my ambitions are around for example um i think this would make a like an amazing tv show god i love this idea or i'm um, i research it and i'm now i'm totally obsessed with it and now i'm going to set upon the road of somehow making it be a thing that can be a job to make it into the world to create it to produce mm-hmm. it to have it be what i also do for a living is make this thing you know put this idea out into the world in some fashion. Um, that's all I'm thinking about. And I'm not, I, I've just, and maybe it's because I let go of these things, but I don't think of it. And then this will happen and this will happen. And then I'll be this. And then I'll be a success. And then I, like, I've just mm-hmm. like that voice is just, you've never had it or you've turned it off. Or... I've, it's lost its voice. It, I don't hear it anymore. When you say you Do... don't know how ambitious you are. Yeah. What does that mean? I just mean, I mean, I, I'm close to extremely ambitious people. And I can just feel that I'm not gunning for that. And I certainly question what that means about myself and if those are things that I hate about myself. I mean, that's, you know. But I'm also just trying to be honest with myself, like, I'm working my ass off. I work every day. I work as hard as I can. I'm like, I think in some ways a workaholic. Like, so it's not a lack of work ethic or towards driving towards something. Like, I want what everybody else wants, of course. But there's just that engine of just like me. Like that, I just, and maybe it's literally like the testosterone starting to drain out of my old ass body. But I just don't feel that anymore. You know? Do you feel, because I think this is a fascinating topic that culturally, especially in your, you know, with all the friends that you have, 
as you said, you're, you're surrounded by extremely ambitious people. Culturally, we have the tendency to value that more, especially um, in men, especially in men, yeah. even though we don't all necessarily need the same things like Rodney and I are in sales and I've been in sales for a long time. Don't care about being the best. I just want to do my job and whatever it may be, at least in that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But it's frowned upon. It's like, oh, you've got to want to be the best. Yeah. So do, because you're a comparer, like, do you find it to be hard to just not to, to accept that maybe you just don't care about success in traditional terms, but success in your terms means you've already hit success. It's just hard for you to accept that because of the surroundings that you're in. Does that make sense? I that agree with that very much. <laughs> I think that's an excellent summary of the conundrum I find myself in. Yes. Yeah. I, I think it's, I think it's so common though. Like this is such a common thing and we all, I mean, I've struggled with it for so many years until yeah. we came up with this and now it's like, whatever this ends up being is success because it's amazing. That's like, right. Right. And what we're doing and is it going to be the best? Maybe. Is it not? Don't care. Right. right? And it's right. sometimes hard to, it's hard for me even to reconcile that. So, I mean, I love what, did, this, this crisis in a way, right? Like, cause it's something, I think it's so common. Sorry. Did you say whatever this ends up being will be a success? Is that what you said? Yeah. I don't know if I agree with that. So, like huh. sometimes success has a discreet, like, for instance, if, you're, if we're playing a game, like, well, I guess that, but then I guess it depends on what you define success as. Correct. That's right. Yeah. Right. Because if, if you just like. Because winning is not, is winning success? Winning is something and it absolutely matters and it's objective and it has consequences and it's the result of preparation and everything else. But that certainly isn't the only thing that's taking place. Right. Luck. It, Totally. And also, um, I don't know, like the, all the like coaches cliches are totally true. Like there's a lot to build on or, you know, I'm working on my left hand and my left hand is improving or whatever I'm playing and I love to play. Like, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> when, I first, when I first moved to Los Angeles, I played racquetball a lot, which I enjoyed because, uh, identity wise it felt like such an old jewish man thing to do and i've always really enjoyed like <laughs> fulfilling that weird you know but what i mean like, yeah i really jewish love pickles man. and i play fucking racquetball come on <laughs> and there was like my me in the future in the locker room with this like incredibly low hanging balls and you know i played with <laughs> other dudes and i was okay i was pretty okay i mean i'm not the most athletic person in the world i can get especially back then this is you know whatever almost 20 years ago i can get around and but when i fucked up i would throw such a tantrum i would smash the racket against the the wall i broke rackets and this is a i can't hide from this i did this people saw me do it that there must have been people, john mcenroy yes but not because the opponent did something but because i fucked it i missed that yeah. i fuck you're I, real hard on yourself like your your self talk was completely like completely would lose my mind, and it trick. I remembered doing that with my brother when we played basketball, my older brother in our driveway, and just the like incredible frustration. And so I don't know, maybe that is ambition. Maybe that's like maybe that's my real spirit is like I'm so competitive that just over time I've just had to like put that shit away because I'm not a like a the win loss percentage is is gruesome well, from the, to the success <laughs> thing. Yeah, a lot of people are open about saying it now. They've learned more from their losses than from their from their their successes. They're winning totally, uh, and and there's a lot in that. At the same time, if you lose, you might not get invited back sure. to, to that thing. But maybe that's not where you're supposed to be. Yeah, or maybe it's where you really wanted to be, and you got to work your way back. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I think, man, this is a this is a good conversation. I yeah. mean, you're definitely, you know. You are definitely where you are. So it's like <laughs> you are where you so are. It's like, yeah, there's a shirt. Yeah. You said um, move when you moved out here. Where'd you move out here from? Uh, came out from New York. So uh, my then girlfriend and I after school moved to New York for, you know, most of our 20s and came out here 
Where, where, wait, school was the Northwestern? We, yeah, Chicago, yeah. Chi Town. Uh, I lived in Chi Town for a little bit. The best. I yeah. lived there for 10 and a half years. Yeah. The best. Do you miss yeah. it? Chicago? Yeah. Um, I miss a lot about Chicago, yeah. But I was so, I mean, that was just, I was such a baby. My head was shoved so far up my ass. I think I miss the idea of Chicago more than Chicago. Uh huh. It's hot. Man. When I was there, it was awesome. And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to stand leaving. And then I got here and I was like, nah, this is better. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I don't. And I went back and I was like, "No, the food's okay there, but it's better here." Like, that's I, that's that's true. Things I, I, but then I went back. We did the air show, Keith. Like that was fun. Yeah, my public transportation, public transport. Oh, yeah. I definitely missed so that. So good. Yeah. So you grew up in Seattle. What what sent you to Northwestern? <laughs> like, what what was growing up in Seattle like for you? Um, Seattle uh, is you know this is pre, um. Everything you know when I grew up in yeah. Seattle, it was like just basically a fungal just a place out, yeah. outcropping of a lake. <laughs> so is this pre Gates? Like oh yeah, this taking is over? Um, this Way is pre Starbucks, really. Mm. And uh, it was great. It was just really like I in my memory of it, it was just cold and wet and dark, and I loved it. And um, Sonic's, you know, just Sonic's games, like yep. yeah, yeah, and. Uh, um, but I was ready to get out of there. So, um, and I wanted to study film and, um, we had family in Chicago. My parents are both from the sh- suburbs of Chicago. So, uh, I ended up at Northwestern. Hmm. What, 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 I'm very curious going back to your comment of your real comparer, like, uh-huh. like what is the, where's that come from? Like, why do you think you're such a comparer? I don't know the source of it. Yeah. Um, what does it mean? You know, I'm, I am definitely close, very close to people that I either grew up with or, um, or I'm just very close to, and I think it's really common in this town, but I'm just close to people that are living my wildest dreams. And, um, I have nothing but gratitude for the fact that I'm doing anything that looks anything remotely like what I wanted to do with my life. So that's the place that I keep trying to stay in, but it's hard to resist being like, fuck, I wish that was me. I really wish I was doing that, you know? Um, what did you want to do when you were 12? I wanted to uh, make f- films. Yeah? I wanted to make yeah. uh, make movies and um, act in like, them and, like, what do you have? Direct, Allen? like, yeah. Oh, okay, got it, yeah. Yeah. So do the right thing for me was a big, like, that's what I want to do with my life. I want to make um that kind of thing and uh, have that kind of um, total expression like that, you know? So you said you have a version of that, but it's not the version that you had in your head or have in your head. You mean my life? Yeah. Yes, of course. Well, yes, my life I'm doing, basically I'm, I'm making shit up for a job and it's sort of like, it's what I, that's, Really, that's enough, you know. Um, that's enough, but it's also very easy to stop feeling like that's enough and start to think that it's not. That's not what it. I, but it's not what I. It's not quite what I. You know. How does that play out with the ambition comment? So you have, you have your dreams, and then you say you are around people that you see living what you saw for you. Sure. So where does the ambition thing or where does that, how does that play out? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> figuring it out. Yeah. I'm figuring that out. Yeah. I don't, that's sort of the, like the, the, um, discord, you know, is that the real shit, the real practice, the parenthood, the, um, stillness, the gratitude, the love, you know, gardening. And I mean that literally gardening, like putting my dumb hands in the earth. Are you, do you have a green thumb? I don't, I mean, I garden a lot. I, and 
the stuff will grow, but I don't know that I'm like particularly skilled at it. I mean, I put my hands in the dirt and stuff dies. <laughs> well, that you might want to talk to somebody about that. <laughs> <laughs> like, does it happen to people? Turns like, out I have a superpower. I don't know. I'm going to try putting some people in dirt and see. Well, but if they're. Well, we'll find out. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe don't try it. I like, you know, what, if it, if it succeeded, you'd probably just don't, don't really need that in your <laughs> Ooh, life. I right. It. I did it. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know that that's, all that is all that matters. And then I try to stay there. Oh, so there's this, the, are you, are you doing this reconciliation between that and sure? Like what matters and what you thought mattered? Yeah. Or what matters and what I want more than that, you know, like, yeah. Um, but I, I feel, yeah, I feel that. Struggle. If, yeah. Like, so if you stack ranked priority, like, what would that be for you? Like, what would you say if you boiled it all down and said of the things I have in my life, husband, father, actor, producer, all of the things that you dream of that you have, like, what would that one, like, what, what are the number one things that, that you would anchor on if all thing, all, everything else wasn't there? Anchor. Yeah. Um, just the four of us, the family. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's such a a critical component of this idea of ambition, right? Like it it is the eternal capitalistic battle to say, I mean, you, you sometimes it's like, do I want to invest everything I am in this one thing and be known and famous and popular and all of those things, but be married four times. Do do you feel guilty? Like when you have to, Go away for work or like go do like be away from your kids or no. be away. From, Weirdly like, enough, I don't. And, um, you know, I think that the elephant in the room in my head right now is like my wife is, is, um, on those, um, you know, <laughs> whatever on those metrics. She's, she's wildly, a baller. wildly more successful yeah. than I am. She's a baller. And that's, and so my struggle is you true. call her more ambitious than you? No, also I mean she is ambitious and I love her ambition, but she's also an what in some ways makes her the most attractive to me is that she's just like love of the game. Mm-hmm. She's just doing it and that's what she wants to be doing. Mm-hmm. She's just a great performer and she has ever more interesting people and things to be able to work on and you know yes there is of course the like big picture of it or whatever in the you know career terms but like she doesn't trouble herself with that shit that much and so i only bring that up to say like necessarily in some ways i've had to like adjust my compass and support that and be you know of service to that in some ways and um was that difficult yes man it's been it's very difficult and (laughs) How so? I was going to say, is the is any of the difficulty in um, just the the typical husband wife yes. male female dynamic? Yes. Yeah, gender is very very hard to ignore those mm-hmm. sort of magnetic pulls for everybody. I think, and for us, of course, and there's a traditional version of our lives that it's hard to not fantasize about. And um, but I wouldn't like that. I don't want to live that life. Right. You know, so. Um, Which doesn't stop you from having having to face the. The visions that you had or the cultural norms or the ego or any of that other stuff. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And um, it's but it's a great it's a it's such a gift. Yeah. It's just such a gift. I really have to take my medicine. Mm-hmm. You know, I just there's no way out. But um but to just take the medicine and be like, yeah, well, this is how it worked out. And Mm -hmm. this is what it is right now. So like, what's right now then, you know? Um, And like, I, I, I absolutely have a very healthy and super destructive, like victim complex for sure. Oh, for sure. Like, like just being a victim makes sense in the way that I view my life. And um, do you know where that comes from? I I don't. What was growing up like 
for you. Like, I really want to understand this. Like, let's get Freudian for a second. Uh huh. Not that this is therapy, but let's get Freudian let's do for it. a second. I yeah. mean, I'm not going to pay you. <laughs> well, please don't. Oh, I don't fine. want your money. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I, I might in, actually uh, lose Moore. a license I don't have. Naturally yeah. Essenced. yeah. Naturally, yeah. my ass. <laughs> Essenced, by the way, essence. Essenced. Hmm. <laughs> I'm mm, melanin that's, essenced. I need a good it's, essencing currently. <laughs> um, I don't know how to answer that question about childhood. You know, um, I'm not sure that anything remarkable. I think that the events of my childhood could have been organized in an infinite number of ways by my mind as I became an adult. So I have like ordered the cards in this particular order in my deck. Interesting. You know, yeah. um, I could have done it a, a, a number of other ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Do you have siblings? I have an older brother, and he was a good tormentor in a lot of ways, and um, and also turns out to be like my closest friend in a lot of ways, and so that relationship could have sent me in many directions. Also, like mm. this is just the way that I've totally taken that information and gone on with it. So interesting. I don't ascribe. I don't, especially for someone who's trying to get over feeling fucking like something happened to me, like a victim. Yeah. There's no need for me to go back. To- yeah, I mean, like, well, yeah. that's because my mom. <laughs> the reason I feel like a victim all the time, you know, like, and at least nothing terrible happened. To <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Me. Like, yeah nothing yeah, yeah. terrible happened to me. Yeah, let's okay. be very clear. Very fucking clear. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Some things happened, and some of them were less. Enjoyable. Well, what I'm learning about it is that uh, it does like traumatic experiences uh-huh. are all about the receiver, like how sensitive you are. Like, what's traumatic does not have to be an overly dramatic scenario. Totally. So when people are like, just get over it, it's like, well, you, like, you don't know how that affected me. Yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, totally. And no, and, dude, and we all, I mean, and you assess it. Like I, when I was growing up just as a, my parents got divorced when I was two, but I had a really easy, like growing up, it was always, you know, I mean, I see both parents. It wasn't this. They weren't mean to each other. It wasn't an overly contentious divorce and they didn't, you know, pit one against the other. And it just was what it was. So I always thought myself, yeah, I mean, you see these stories on TV of what divorce could really be. Right. So I've got it good. Right. It turns out it actually had an effect on me of course. that I'm only coming to realize many years later. Right. And it, it's, it's a weird thing about trauma and how it influences us as as developing brains. I really, I really can relate to that. That is, do, um, do you and your bro, and I, we don't have to go too far on it, but do you see events like from growing up? Do you see them the same or do you remember them differently? Oh yeah. I think we, I think we do remember the events the same. Yeah. 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 We certainly have like, you know, taken away from the rubble different shards you know yeah, what i mean yeah, he's yeah. totally gone about his life in a different way but yeah it's affected you differently but you sure. you remember it the same at least yeah yeah why do you ask uh talking to my siblings about stuff like there's stuff that i straight up don't remember yeah or i remember completely differently like it's very yeah weird. yeah strange I'm trying to figure that out yeah it's crazy it's so um unpredictable which moments you actually have you actually pressed record on mm-hmm you know, mm-hmm. well, like to your point, how did you organize it as an adult? Like, right. how did you yeah. ascribe meaning to it? Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Why are you holding on to these pebbles? Right. And so many of them are so meaningless. You know, I have just the weirdest memories of like begging this babysitter to do this bit she once did where she pretended she was like a pitch person going through my refrigerator or refrigerator at home. Like, taking out objects and, and pretending she was like doing a commercial for them. Uh, and I was so like the delighted. Sham-wow guy. What's that? Like the sham. Wow. Yeah, right? Sham. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, um, I remember Shake begging way. her to do it again and she just didn't want to. And mm. like looking back, I'm like, Oh, the first time I think she was just stoned. Uh. And I mean, you know, this is 70, whatever, 78, yeah. 79. So I'm sure she came to my house and whatever. God bless. And, but I just have such a memory of like pleading with her and her saying no and getting more and more annoyed with me yeah. and me being so confused by her annoyance. And like, what is that? Why does that yeah. always, that just yeah. comes around once a month. Like, I where think, do they come from? What does it mean? Like, is that my kink? Yeah. Like, is that like, 
Was that like early arousal? <laughs> yeah. Her denial? I, is this what I need my wife to start doing is Denying marketing me? to me? Well, she's intuiting that. Oh. Oh, I'm just, come on. That's well, just an easy joke. I got you. That's just an easy joke. What, um, so victim complex. Sure. What, what, uh, I mean, I have a, I, I do it a little bit myself. I think maybe, I don't know if everybody does it. I do it for sure. But what does it mean for you? I mean, it means I forgot to tell Catherine that I have tickets to go see a comedy show tonight and my daughter's having a sleepover and it will be really annoying to try to get out of the house to go see this show that a friend of mine is performing in that he months ago asked me if I wanted to go see and I said, of course. And now I either have to tell her I forgot to fucking tell you, but I have to go to this show tonight and deal with those consequences or more likely text him. Um, oh my God, dude, I'm so sorry. And then what will come next will be the, the words of someone who is having their life happen to them. It's just been chaotic. I fucked up. I got this other situation. I'm so sorry. And some version of I'm just, you wouldn't believe how battered I am by the events that are around me. That's what's justifying my terrible behavior. And I am so sorry that I am so fucked up and I fucked this up. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think just, that's what I mean is like, I am the, I am the recipient of my life. And that's just a story that I tell myself or tell others to justify what is behavior that is not, yeah. not the result of that. Wow. It's just the result of poor time management and poor communication. Bad decisions. And ambivalence about yeah. going and like yeah. wanting to be a good friend and, and probably have fun, but also like, you know, whatever. It's a Friday night and it's a, I'm an old man. You know? <laughs> Curious to, and Rodney, I don't know if you had a, on the, the victim mentality. On the point? I no, I was going to go elsewhere. Yeah. I was too. Um, this is the struggle. This is always the fun party. Then are we in alignment yes. or aren't we? Yes. Yeah. And nine times out of 10, we are. Yeah. Which is a very weird thing to happen. Especially uh, you're but, so uh, remote, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. It's like this. We Borg. 17 years of friendship, I guess I it, it. it pays off. But that question Rodney asked is like, when you were 12, where'd you want to be? This is actually a prior guest question or his answer to, um, what do you ask or tell a young person? And he follows it up with, well, what's preventing you from being there? Uh -huh. So I'm curious, like what, what prevents you from pursuing can still the, um, uh, movie creation, uh, or being, being a, the creator of film. Um, first I, have to say that the structure of that question smacks of Scientology and makes me very uncomfortable. <laughs> okay. I wish I knew more about Scientology at this very moment. <laughs> I wish moment. I knew more of Scientology. Well, I've, I've seen uh, uh, Leah Romini's uh, special on yeah. HBO. Or, so I've yeah, just seen the South Park episode. Step back a little bit from what stopped <laughs> okay. me from getting Keith's about want. to pull out a... Uh, <laughs> yeah, E-gram? Yeah. E meter? <laughs> yeah, we're going to do, we're yeah. do your levels or I'm whatever. Just, I'm curious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the... I think the real, the honest answer to that is nothing. I that's what I'm doing every day, all day, as I'm trying to make a bunch of stuff. And um, yeah, because um, it, it is the world you live in. It is what you're doing. All I'm doing now. I I I I made the prob. I I made the decision to get out of the. I quit my job basically, and um, uh, my uh, creative partner, my writing partner of 16 years, and I went our separate ways oh. uh, just in the oh. new year. You broke up the band. We, we broke up the band. And, um, and so this is in many ways, this is, uh, this is always what I've been dreaming of, about is a time where I can just every day uh, be with my family and work my ass off on only things that I care about. And, mm. um, you know, none of it is a job. None of it pays me a, a dollar, but they're all moving towards ideally a place where um, at least that'll, that'll crash. I'm going to do a Rodney brain thing here. Very, very familiar to me. Yeah. I'm going to try and connect thoughts that are seemingly very Fine. disconnected. Let's see if we can do this. Yeah. So you were just talking about that and the, so leaving like 16 years writing together yeah. or working together creatively Yeah. at the beginning of this year of 19. Yeah. So I think of things like that moving 
as very violent processes. Like they just, they shake up everything mentally, physically. And in the lead up to this, you, you mentioned that you're very interested in monsters and violence. Yeah. What did you mean by that? Oh, um, didn't that, think that's where you were going. Me neither. Um, sure. I mean that that's what I'm really, uh, that's what my work is about right now. I'm, um, that's what you're writing. And I'm writing about a kind of monster story and, oh. um, in, and I'm, I'm investigating, um, in another area, sort of, uh, a real brief moment of violence that has kind of lingered in my life. And so, um, that's what just occupies my thoughts and the stuff mm. I'm reading about. And I'm just very, you know, they they've discovered recently that the Neanderthals and we, or that we who are also descendants of Neanderthals, you know, <laughs> that there were more than one kind of human being coexisting and that one was a lot bigger and browier and hairier <laughs> and, um, less, um, you know, frontal cor- cortexier and, that a lot of our monster stories comes from that fear of sort of like at night, hoping they don't come around. And, um, that just is really fucking interesting to me. Those like that monster in the shadow is something that I've just been thinking a lot about, you know? Um, uh, Hmm. interesting. This is, um, this is a very ambitious, step in life like do you see it that way you know Hmm. i mean i don't see it that way Mm -hmm. um and this answer i don't i think is not going to be a good color on me but i it feels like it's a now or never situation that um my friend and uh, partner and I, we 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 hammered away at it for a, quite a while and ha- did many things, and we're very fortunate. And it went great. Did it go? Did that thing turn into a series that we were the stars of? No, it didn't. And that movie didn't happen. And this, you know, we had our. That's mostly what it was like. And in the meantime, we kept going and working and collaborating and making a bunch of stuff that I'm really proud of. And um. But whatever, it just kind of, you know, this feels like at my age, um, if there are things that I need to try to make, mm-hmm. that this is it, that I have to get to it. Mm-hmm. And um, so I used to have, we used to have a day job, we wrote on a show, and then on the side we had our stuff that we were always working on. And then in the wee hours, um, I had my shelf of stuff that I have always wanted to do and sometimes would try to fit in. and. Basically, I've taken the first two layers of stuff that took my time and energies, and I've removed them. And so now mm-hmm. all I'm doing is working on those things that that have been nagging at me. And um, we'll try to like let these baby turtles like run across the beach to the ocean. And I know that most of them never make it, but at least they'll get a shot. I somewhat follow Keith's thought on this. I guess one thing we never did is uh, define ambition. Oh, that's a really good point. What do you, how do you define it, Ethan? And then Keith, you next. What does it mean? I just don't know if I'm equipped for this. I don't know. I can go straight up Webster's and see what they you say. could. Okay, I mean, I would prefer it. Yeah, I think that's the most standard way of managing language, right? <laughs> the dictionary is to investigate subjectively what a word means to each person. <laughs> well, but yeah, to each person. So like how you use it yeah. may be different than what no, we're that's about definitely to learn. True. That's a, isn't that the bitch about language, especially English? Like yeah. that, this is one of the conversation things that Rodney and I, one of the conversation tips that we ha- talk about a lot is not assuming intent because we all come from, like we all think about something differently and sometimes it's just as much as the words we use um, could mean something entirely different for somebody oh, else. Like yell, yelling means oh. that, yelling means a different thing yeah. to me than it means to my wife. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It means different to me yep. and my wife. Yeah. Yep. Did you get to uh, ambition yet? Yeah, it's incredible. So ambition, noun, a strong desire to do or achieve something, typically requiring determination and work. See, and I think that's like 
that's the funny thing about ambition. We look at it as I need to. Well, the next definition to what you're about to say, the next def- yeah. the next one says a desire and determination, determination to achieve success. So that's why people tie ambition and success. But the first definition, the the very first does not. Right. That's a, at all. That's a cultural thing. It, it's like. And to Keith's point, like what you're you said, you cut out two thirds of the work you were doing so you could do the one third that you really care about. And that's it. I I see it as ambitious because it is not the easy thing. I'm assuming it's not the easy thing. No, it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. I'm on. I don't have a job. It's terrifying. (laughs) It's harrowing. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, we think about that, like with what we're doing. Yeah. What I want, I would love to just get rid of the paycheck. Of course. So this will be our paycheck. That's right. And it's a terrifying decision. It's a huge and, leap of faith. Yeah. 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 So it that is. seems ambitious to me. I think that fits the definition. Um, I, 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 I mean, was the was the verb was it a strong desire? A strong desire, desire to do or achieve. Well, achieve. See, and achieve, achievement and success get I lumped know. together. I know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because like what achieving. I mean, yeah. I mean, what does that mean? <laughs> like, what do you want to do with this? And we'll see. I'm it's call on it the this seminar. ambitious seminar. phase. Like, what's the what's the goal? What's the outcome that you're striving for? To make your own stuff, right? Yeah, just to make my own stuff. Yeah. I mean, listen, we could get specific. I could say like this pilot I wrote, it's to this person and I hope that becomes a series and blah. Like, of course it's all tied up, but, but sure. honestly, there's been so many days that I've been lucky enough to take the kids to school and then exercise and then meditate a little bit and then get in here to this weird garage. This garage is awesome, by the way. Thank you so much. I, I really do love it. I know that's, I should, I feel awkward saying I feel like that. everybody should have a space that they love. I love this space and like it's it's you know it's mostly garage it's a little bit office but I just put a lot of stuff on the wall and there's like one of the things says I love dick I mean it's there's the word dick blaring at me <laughs> <laughs> which motivates me to you know my my ambitions are really around and it's like you know this is uh, there's more than one morning I'm just like thank thank you thank There's been a lot of dick and balls in this episode sorry yeah. it's okay I should have warned you yeah yeah um, but ambition, like I, I just, I find it, I, I love this conversation about it because I think it traverses everybody's existential crisis when it comes to what do I want to do in life? And, you know, I'll we share. all have to make t- tough decisions, right? I'll, I mean, I for me, it's, it. it's difficult for me because I have these, I, I've placed a certain amount of importance around what I'll call success or mm-hmm money or fame or like things that I want to accomplish. And at the same time, I have my family and that's, what's really important. And at the same time, they got to eat. Like I got to, you know, they got like one of us in the equation somehow, some way has to make sure money's coming in the door. And so there's all these jobs. That's why I asked the question, like, do you get jealous or um, guilty when you're not, when you're not around them? Uh huh. Because I have this thing where it's like, oh, I got to go work. Uh huh. And I think it's when I'm doing work that I'm not really, uh huh, attached to personally. When it's something I love, it's like, no, it's cool. It's like what I should be doing. But when it's something else, like my main gig, it's like you don't feel like the paycheck element of that sort of justifies the uh, I logic. Emotion. Logically, yeah, but emotionally, emotionally, no. Logically, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, like I. <laughs> I, I would say it now, like Microsoft is my main investor. Mm-hmm. Like they, they keep the, they allow this to happen. Uh-huh. Like I wouldn't be able to buy equipment and uh-huh. drive around town and make my schedule Your what it is. Equipment, by the way, is really great. This screen is very impressive. These mics are really nice. I like the stand that the mixer is on. Your laptop is beautiful. Oh, thanks. And uh, that's my baby. It's just, just really. I just think this is a great setup. And I was going to say so earlier, but I thought it would sound kind of weird if well, I was like, "But yeah, I'm, I thank you." I'm Appreciate thinking it. out a little bit about it. It's yeah, very fresh. I've Appreciate done it. a few podcast podcasts. <laughs> podcasts. I've done some podcasts in my life, and uh, <laughs> this is the this is the best <laughs> gack wise by far. Oh, thank you. Sure, man. Nice. I'm I'm the tech nerd, so I, I feel yeah. like I, I saw I, I saw take a little bit of solve. You figured it out. Yeah, yeah. My setup's not so pretty. I can tell. 
<laughs> yeah, my setup's oh my not as good. That's why you, I'm very small in in the in this <laughs> ridiculous. Um, I want to talk a little bit about parenting and dad, right, especially right. from a dad perspective. Right. Um. So you talked a little bit about being around more and helping out with kids while your wife is doing things she's doing. Yeah. So there's that aspect, but like, what does being a dad mean to you? Oh wow. Well, I mean, I feel really lucky that I am a dad in this generation of dads. Um, I know that my dad did not change my diaper one time. I know that for the most part, my dad didn't cook dinner. And I know for the most part that my dad felt fatherhood was about in some ways, um, integrity and, um, the public world, the public space, and what identity there meant, and life lessons. He would have things he would say to me sometimes, like, uh, uh, when you're asleep, you're not doing things. I'll sleep when I'm dead. He would like say these mm-hmm. kind of tropes, which, looking back, I know he didn't even mean. So he must have felt a need to embody a certain kind of, you know, idealized manliness and, and providerness mm-hmm. and morality. And I feel all those things too, but I also know that every time I crack that and every time I'm show, every time I cry in front of my daughter, which I am not proud to say is that happens, uh, kind of often, you know, I took, I put on a old song in the car the other day and just completely fell apart. Yo. And you know, she's like, she was like there for it. And I know that that's in its own small way, kind of a revolution. I changed a million diapers. Did you ever see your dad cry? I eventually did see my dad cry. Yes, but he was older, you know, um, now you, you specifically said cry in front of your daughter. What about in front oh, of your I've son? Cried in front of my son for sure. Yeah. For sure. And uh, I cry easily in music. So it happens a lot on the ride to school. And, you know, I'm overwhelmed. And and I, I single parent a lot. I don't mean that like, I am just mean my wife's gone. So yeah, I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just doing it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, traditionally, gender-wise, that's unusual. And I'm proud of that. And yeah. I'm really excited that this young boy who's starting the horrifying transition into manhood whatever the fuck that is, that he's got a man in his life who loves him, who says it, who like is physical with him, is affectionate, is weak, is a fool, is a baby, is honest about that, is like um, sometimes unpredictable, but is always there. And he knows that I would do anything ever for him ever. And, you know, fucking assistant coached his um, baseball team with Scooter. Like, you know, I'm just there. And I'm not saying I'm good at any of it, but mm. I'm absolutely there in ways that men traditionally in our culture have not been there for the kids. And yeah. I'm not patting myself on the back. <clears throat> I know that there's lots of women in this world that get fucking furious when men get a goddamn ribbon for doing any parenthood. Yeah. You know? Yeah, totally. Th- yeah. I know you don't do parenthood, but um, kind of. I don't know. It's like babysitting your own kids. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> like the world should be so impressed that we do what has been happening for right. centuries. That, that, right. But like, I think also that's true. And so I don't expect, but I do think that there has to be an effect on the generation of these kids that are being raised by men that are in their lives in ways that men have not been previously. Do you think it took a, some of the stuff that you mentioned? Do you think it took a toll on your dad? The pursuit of manhood? Yeah. I think it takes, I think the pursuit of manhood puts us in the grave. We, our hearts blow up and we die. And as we die, we say, I wish I told my dad I love him. And then, then you're dead. And I think that's what men have been doing forever. And, uh, it's insane. And yes, sir. Oh no. Keep, keep going. I'm (laughs) sorry. This is a particular. (laughs) Yeah. One thing. And again, I'm just like showing my ass here. I know that I don't have the, the, the knowledge to say any of about what I'm about to say. I'm not qualified for this opinion, 
But I think that one thing that is a real tragedy, seriously, culturally, is that in the early 90s, when, when the men's movement actually started and took baby steps, that Robert Bly, God bless him, that poet, and his dumbass Iron John. I like Iron John. I mean, it's beautiful, but it just made the men's movement a, um, a bunch of white guys in the woods playing drums crying. And right. that is too easy hippie, to make fun a hippie of. Hippie move. Right? Yeah. yeah. We, you know, we're, now we're talking about toxic masculinity. Yeah. Thankfully, we're finally starting to talk about what is the real problem. And it's taken so fucking long. And I wish that we, it could have started from that place, that, like, this construct is super destructive to everybody, you know, including the people that are trying to uphold whatever agreement this is. Yeah. You know, it's it's a suicidal task. And I would agree. I Like, I get the Blythe comment because I think I like the book. Like, it is – I had to read it a couple times to understand it because I don't do poem and soliloquy very well. It's, yeah. I, I, just be, be direct. Don't, don't. – <laughs> no. What is, wait, who's walking through the woods? What do you mean? <laughs> he didn't like his mom. Like, I don't understand. Yeah, like, no, he, he was, yeah, oblique. Yes, very much oblique, but it's, it is beautifully written. Yeah. And I think it makes some very good points. And I also think some of them were taken wrong. Sure. Or maybe just taken how they were taken. And then it's fired it off into wild tangents of the men's, move, men's movement, which, which is also kind of funny because, like, the men's movement, it's like, it's a terrible men title. Are, men run shit. Like, why do they need yeah. a movement? We're, we're, we, we are the movement. We I know. Been, it's it's right. because it's not a... Um, it is so awkward. It's so, like, beautifully awkward and horrible. Yeah. yeah. But it... it I and, I... and I love that. But it definitely is, like, the most... Kavanaugh. Huh. You know what I mean? Like... What are we going to do? Because until they're not all going to just die off. Because look at that fucking kid from Kentucky grinning like an asshole to that Native American in the front of the Lincoln Memorial. Like it's it's not stopping. It's not like like they're all the baby boomers are the problem. It's still it's we are raising boys to turn into Kavanaugh's or to try to, and most of them are going to fail. And in the and in the meantime, they're going to be what is that horrible phrase? Um, Incel, um, yeah know. the the uh, online the incelibates, uh, yes. the the, the, the men like, who just complete. I mean, it is disgusting what they do what, and say what? about it's, what's happening women. right now. It's like we yeah. are. It's what I call myself if I'm a person who has no who celibate, but it's not on purpose. Right, and so that justifies like it's being done to me. Wait, what? Yeah, that's right. No, yeah, one will because fuck me. women have rejected them, and they have never, you know, they they think women are all evil because of all of these things, and they are horrible. So this is like an like, evil straight edge. Yeah, that's right. But it's like, but it's like an evil straight edge who's like saying, "I'm straight. I'm a straight edge because I don't. I'm not old enough to buy beer." Yeah. So that's yeah, why it's I'm an so. On, yeah, it's an online community. It's very. Let, let me ask. It's, it's unsettling. I want to, this is interesting. I want to go back real quick. Toxic. You mentioned toxic masculinity. Yes. What does that mean for like for you? Oh, totally. Um, I mean, for me, I think toxic masculinity, masculinity is, is um, the performance and pursuit of maleness in its um, most base um, and frankly destructive form you know the masculinity that's like take and achieve and uh and i think it's totally i know this is like a really obvious thing to say but i think obviously this is what comes back to my shyness shyness around um ambition because the the truth is of course i'm incredibly ambitious of mm -hmm. course i am i'm like obsessively ambitious and competitive and self-centered and I want what I want and I work really hard every day to get it. Of course that's true. And, and the compare of course is also just a competitive, like fuck mm -hmm. I'm better. Fuck. What am I doing wrong? And, right. Why am I not there? And all of those thoughts and feelings are totally disgusting to me. And Which is use, why you hesitant to use them. And so and I cover it and I, I try to, 
to quell it and I put it away and I try to remember gratitude and I try to be a better better. And that either comes because in the games that I'm playing in terms of ambition and competitiveness, I for a second thought you were just holding my dog's hand. I was. I, no, I, no, earlier I was. You, you I, I've been waiting for you to notice. You I was have, like romantically been holding hands. Yeah, yeah, we've just been. She's dead asleep. She's not even budging. I'm just straight up just stroking the bottom of her paw. She, her, that's her great. Paw. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. And I hope also that it's I mean, that it works out connection. Yeah. yeah. This is probably coming from what's truthfully like an Al Anon esque codependence on my part, but like Man, we could we could go in on that. Right. Codependence and me. <laughs> you talked about victim. I started thinking about Cartman's triangle. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. I, I, hey, we can get in on that. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> but I I was going to say that I what I'm super psyched about for both this little boy and this little girl is that in this family, the mom is going out into the world and is whooping ass and then coming home and being like this crazily energetic, um, passionate, um, like breakneck mom. And then she goes back out and resumes kicking ass, you know, Mm -hmm. in a kind of role that traditionally would be male Mm -hmm. would be like, you know, dad is a fucking attorney general of whatever. And he goes on long trips and like, you know, yeah, I think that's just incredible. And like my ego really is sucking its own thumb about it, but like, that's okay. Good. Yeah. And what that's awesome that, that they see all of that, the struggle and the reality of it. I think it's, it's messy and often disgusting. It's messy. Yeah. This whole, this, this time period, you guys talk about this generation of being parents. It's all, messy but i think change is is change is messy like it's going to be for for women to be treated how they should be and for things to to level out and for p- people to be treated right it's going to be messy cuz uh, cuz what's going to happen is people that are in power and in power for the reasons that other people are oppressed yeah have to be checked and they don't like that they don't think like it the, they think it's death i mean if you think about right. um i i forgot his name already what's his name who uh, supreme court Kavanaugh. 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 So you think about that. Like all the people around him, all the white men around him that protected him, they're like, oh yeah, well, I, I see myself in that situation. That's why so, they were so I mad. can't I can't indict him because that's like indicting me. They were furious. And and even not the white like the, I've talked to plenty of non white men around that scenario who felt the same way. They're like, No, like you can't you can't go back to a man's past and, and talk about it and say, Man, because they're in the fraternity of men, so an attack on one is an attack on all, and that's how it's perceived and taken. And I like that we're having the conversation about it, though, because yeah, we gotta we gotta start looking at these things. In my opinion, he was so furious that they would besmirch his name and his family's name and ruin his life and take from him all of his achievements. And that fury was genuine, and for sure, from the bottom of his soul. He we was, talk about entitled. You know how people talk about millennials being entitled. That's entitlement, though. Like he felt he was entitled to that Supreme Court he'd seat worked for it his whole life. Every day he'd done the right thing. How dare He's you smarter. take this from me? You can't. How dare you? And 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 suggest that I'm not what I am, which is incredible and deserving. And if you stop me here, if you do to me right here what is done to the rest of the world every day, all the fucking time, which is say turn around, you're not welcome. You didn't do it right. Yeah. You fucked up or whatever. If you do this to me on this last stage of this, I mean, he's at the mountain top. He's at the peak he's, of, of human he's, achievement. He's, 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 he's there at top Everest in line waiting to hit the pinnacle. And he's Stuck about behind to die. some noobs. And yeah. he's like, I got to get in. It's like, dude, look, <laughs> look, look where you are, baby. Like you're around okay. you, man. That yeah. was, that was a good. shot to the white male yeah. establishment that was like, oh, wait, if he can be questioned. Oh, yeah. Can't we all? Yeah. Yeah. That we can't let that happen. That brilliant woman who like put together an extraordinary life and who did a heroic thing of putting her face out there for all those dickheads to talk about all the awful things that they're going to talk about. And just because she's trying to fucking do the right thing and like, and nope. <laughs> Before I ask the last question real quick, like, cause you, yeah. you, you set the victim thing and then you said somewhere in there, like somebody whose life is happening to them. How do you get out of that mode? Like, how, what do you have anything you do to get out of feeling like your life's happening to you? 
I, like the older I get, the more I, it's so obvious how simple it is for me. And I suspect for most human beings, but for me in particular, if I meditate and I exercise, I am infinitely better as just a energy. And how long do you meditate? I do the transcendental, the TM stuff. I do 20 minutes. Um, I've never tried TM. I've heard good, like, it's it, it's like the number one most recommended. I think that it's in some ways the Bikram of meditation and that it's like kind of franchised and it's super like um, uh, standardized. Mm-hmm. And so it's easily taught. And so therefore there's you can go. There's a million places of TM places all over the world. Um, but it's great for me. It's really great. And yeah. uh um, so that's how I get out of those kind of like negative, you know, cycles of thought or whatever. Yeah. Um, I don't do it. I mean, my practice in both exercise and meditation is spotty. Yeah. So, but yeah. you get it when you need it. Yeah. I try for the most, it. yeah, <laughs> for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a different human if I don't get those two things. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. What, um, thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure. So I got yeah, heated there you. for a second. This is Sorry fun. about the manhood rant. No, that's good. I think we need more no, men to, to rant about it. manhood. That was great. And like stand yeah. up for taking care of your, your kids. Like that. I yeah. think that. I think that is manhood, personally. You know. Yeah. So I, I like that you got heated about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, this has been awesome. I I want to grab a bourbon. Yes. And hang out for another five hours. Yeah, let's do it. But we can't do that right oh, now. Right. No, uh, I can't do that. What would you leave our guests with, Ethan? Yeah. Our guests, our get, our guests, our listeners. Um, I would leave the listeners with a a, a small prayer of um, nice to meet you, and uh, you know, good luck with what you're about to do when you stop listening to this um, well produced and well hosted podcast.